Right. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Maita Dior and I'm from Ziel Darmstadt. And as already mentioned today, I would like to talk about uh, our experimental search for the tetra neutron, where we probed a four neutron system using the alpha knockout reaction from helium-8. And I will present, of course, our very recent result that was published two weeks ago. So although already presented in the previous talk, still allow me to start with a brief overview of some of the experimental work. So the quest for the tetraneutron has started in the early 60s by looking for bound tetraneutrons that are produced in fission of uranium and continued later using other probes such as transfer reactions or double charge exchange reaction. But overall, during the 20th century, none of the experiments resulted in any indication for the existence of such a tetraneutron, either as a bound or as a resonant state. Then towards the 21st century, it became feasible to use radioactive ionic. Now, if such a system exists, one would expect an enhanced formation of it in such a neutron-rich environment. And indeed, some positive signals have been reported since then with indications both for bound tetraneutron and for resonance state. So the first indication was reported in 2002 from Danil, where they used a breakup reaction of beryllium-14 into beryllium-10 and a system of four neutrons. Then by measuring the final state particles, they observed six events that were shown to be consistent with a bound tetraneutron, although later on it was also shown to be consistent with a low energy resonance. About a decade later, another indication for a resonance was reported from Riken. And in this case, they used a double charge exchange reaction where two protons from helium-4 target are changed into two neutrons, leading to beryllium-8 and four neutrons. And then by measuring two alpha particles from the decay of beryllium-8, they reconstructed the energy spectrum of the four neutron system and saw four events just above the threshold, which were shown to be consistent with a tetraneutron resonance Although due to the large uncertainty that you can see here in the measurement, they couldn't really rule out the possibility of a bound state. And finally, very recently, a surprising result was reported by a group from Munich. So this time an indication for a bound tetraneutron. And in this case, a multinucleon transfer reaction was considered using both lithium-7 beam and target. So transferring free protons leads to carbon-10 and four neutrons in the final state. And by measuring the energy of the fragment, they reconstructed, as shown here in red, the total excitation energy of carbon-10 plus the neutron. Then they observed the peak, which is shown here in blue. And in order to interpret it, basically two possible scenarios were considered. So the first one was that carbon-10 is produced in its ground state. And this corresponds to a tetraneutron resonance at this energy of around 3 MeV, but which has an extremely small width of 0.2 MeV, which was considered to be not realistic. And therefore they favor the second explanation where in this case, carbon-10 is actually produced in its first excited state. And then this corresponds to a tetraneutron system that is bound by about 0.4 MeV. So overall, up to now, uh, three indications have been uh, shown. But as we can see here, those signals were all rather weak without showing a clear experimental observation. No? So with that, I would like to move to the present experimental work. Now, the idea of the measurement was to use the 
quasi-elastic knockout reaction of an alpha particle from helium-8 that is induced by a target proton in order to try to populate a possible tetraneutron state. And in addition, in this measurement, we are using the missing mass technique. So this means a precise measurement of the charged particles that are involved in the reaction, which then allows us to go and reconstruct the energy spectrum of the four neutron system. Now, helium-8 is uh, well suited as a starting point since it has a pronounced structure of an alpha core and four valence neutrons, such that after the alpha knockout, the residual four neutron system might have a large overlap with such a tetraneutron state. And this exact reaction was studied using a five-body cluster model, COSMA, where the properties of a four neutron system after such a sudden removal of an alpha particle from helium-8 were investigated. So the helium-8 wave function is treated by introducing a source term that depends on the internal structure of helium-8 and that accounts for the reaction mechanism producing the four neutron system by considering the overlap between the helium-8 and the alpha particle wave function. And then to determine the final scattering state, uh, transformation of the helium-8 wave function into the center of mass frame of the four neutron system is applied, which due to the relative motion between the alpha and the four neutrons results in a significant L equals zero component that corresponds to uh, an overlap probability with a configuration of a tetraneutron of about 30%. No? OK. And uh, then finally, we considered a specific kinematic for the reaction of large momentum transfer between the proton and the alpha that is equivalent to large center of mass angles close to 180 degrees, so basically backward scattering. Now, the proton alpha cross section has been measured at the exact same energy that was used in this experiment. And although it is very small at this region, it ensures us what we call a recallless production, such that no additional momentum is transferred to the neutrons in the reaction. So basically, in this situation, the alpha particle is slowed down from its initial B momentum. The proton becomes the fastest particle in the reaction, and the four neutrons continue with their B momentum. Now, this experiment was part of an experimental campaign that was performed at Riken at the Samurai Experimental Area using a primary beam of oxygen 18. And it includes, in addition to the experiment that I present here, an experiment to study the low energy dipole response of helium-8 using a Coulomb breakup, as well as the experiment that we just saw in the previous talk. So the secondary beam of helium-8 is produced and separated along the big risk fragment separator and transported into the samurai spectrometer. So the beam enters from big rips, and then we had the target area that was composed from a five centimeters of a liquid hydrogen target followed by three planes of dedicated silicon detectors that were built especially for this experiment in collaboration with CU Munich and were used for tracking of both the proton and the alpha particle after the reaction. So of course we want to identify two tracks that emerge from the same reaction point of the reaction vertex but due to a finite resolution, these two tracks will never cross each other at a single point. Therefore, we use the approach of the minimum distance between the two tracks and apply a cut to ensure that the two came from the same reaction. 
With this, we can then go and reconstruct the reaction vertex along the target in all the three dimensions. Now, since a rather big target was used, it was crucial to obtain good vertex resolution in order to obtain good momentum resolution and to correct for the energy loss of the particles, the proton and the alpha, which is very different. And with this configuration, we achieved an average vertex resolution of about one millimeter. Then after the silicon, the proton and the alpha are bent under the influence of the samurai magnet and can be tracked and identified at the focal plane using a drift chamber and two walls of plastic scintillator. The alpha particles in the first wall and the protons in the second one. And finally, by combining the information from all detectors, we can reconstruct their momenta, where we obtained a relative momentum resolution of about 0.1% for the protons. And here we can see their momenta. So clearly, due to the large momentum transfer in the reaction, the alpha particles are slowed down compared to the B momentum where the protons are faster here. Now, although we talk about the missing mass, only the charged particles, in principle, as we can see here, and as we also saw in the previous talk, two neutron detectors were also part of the experimental setup. The Neuland demonstrator from the R3B setup at GSI and Nebula, which were used together successfully at Samurai for several experiments. But in our case here, due to the very small cross section for the reaction, which is at the order of one microbarn, the obtained statistics is not very high. So overall, we measure about 400 events of a proton and an alpha, which basically makes it impossible to detect more than two neutrons in a coincidence. And even that just is a very small fraction. So therefore, we only use events with one neutron, which is detected as a consistency check of the recoilless production. So as an example, what we can see here, that is the velocity of the neutron. Now, since no additional momentum is transferred to the neutrons, we expect that its velocity in the rest frame of helium-8, of course, will be very small and indeed shown by the data. And basically it can only be modified due to the relative energy between the neutrons. So now before looking at the helium-8 data as a benchmark measurement, we use the same alpha knockout reaction, but from a helium-6 projectile. And in this case, we expected the relative energy spectrum of the residual two neutron system will be well described by the theory. Since the system of two neutrons, the di neutron is well known to be unbound by about 100 kilobits. Now, the theoretical input that we use to describe the relative energy spectrum between these two neutrons includes both the ground state wave function that is shown here in green, as well as the final state interaction between the neutrons. Now the total distribution is shown here in blue, where for comparison, the one without the final state interaction peaks at a higher energy with a tail that extends towards higher energy. Now, in addition, as we can see from the title of this paper here, it focuses on the neutron-neutron scattering length. But in our case here, we are not really sensitive to the exact value of the scattering length since the energy range that is covered, which is required due to the use of the missing mass is very wide up to about 70 MeV, where the differences are only visible at the region of low energy. So now allow me to make a short interlude regarding the neutron-neutron scattering length. Now in this plot, we can now see the calculated relative energy distribution at the region of low energy up to one MeV. And here we see the distribution using different values for the scattering lengths. 
So the commonly used value of minus 18.7 Fermi and plus minus two Fermi. In addition, we see here a calculation based on two different approaches for the final state interaction. And basically what we can see from here is that the scattering length affects mainly this region here of relative energies around 100 kV. So clearly this indicates that in order to be able to distinguish between the different values of the scattering lengths, a very high resolution is needed. Now, experimentally, the neutron-neutron scattering lengths has been measured using different reactions. And here we can see some recent experimental data. Now, the blue band here represents the current accepted value that is based on pion induced measurements. But then we can see here that there is a systematical significant difference between values which are extracted from neutron breakup measurements from two different collaborations. So we can see that here, basically the um, solid ellipses, these are two results. So basically the same measurement from a group from Bonn. And in this case, they obtained value which is smaller comparing to a second group, which performed the measurement using the exact same reaction of neutron breakup and using the same theoretical treatment. And in fact, this discrepancy between the two measurements is still unsolved and it suggests that there is some systematic uncertainty. So actually a new experiment was proposed and accepted at Samurai to determine the neutron-neutron scattering lengths with high precision. And this will be done using the same alpha knockout reaction that we talk about, but using the invariant mass method. So reconstructing the relative energy spectrum by measuring directly the two neutrons from the reaction. And this will be done using HIME, which is a plastic scintillator based array to, for multi neutron detection. And HIME has been proposed and built with an active area of 40 by 40 centimeters squared, where now we are building a TU dumps that uh, measure extension to 100 centimeters squared that will provide us the necessary geometrical acceptance that is needed for the measurement. And in addition, thanks to its high granularity, it will provide very good resolution, in particular relative energy resolution that is better than 25 kV at this region of interest. And from simulations, we estimated that an overall uncertainty of about 1% in the measurement can be reached. And this corresponds to a difference of 0.2 Fermi in the scattering lengths that will clearly allow us to be able and determine its um, value precisely. So going back to our benchmark helium-6 measurement, we have a theoretical prediction shown here in blue. And now in order to be able to compare it to our experimental data, we first need to simulate it. So what we do is that we generate quasi-elastic events according to the measured proton alpha cross-section at large center of mass angle. We run this generated sample through a full simulation of the experimental setup in order to take into account for our acceptance. Then we smear the simulated data according to the internal resolutions of the detector, which together with the struggling of the particles in the different materials results in an energy resolution of about one MeV. And finally, we analyze the simulated data in the exact same way as the experimental data and reconstruct the relative energy spectrum using the missing mass from the momenta of the charged particle. So with that, we can now compare our measured spectrum to the simulated theoretical input. And we see a very good agreement between the two, which 
confirms the expected dye neutron peak that is unbound by about 100 keV. Now, in addition, the energy region, which is shown here, represents the one that is covered by our experimental setup. So we do not see any background events in an unphysical region. And also the background contribution that can barely be seen here is very small, which I will say a few words about in the helium-8 case. So with that, we can move to the helium-8 case and the relative energy spectrum of the four neutron system. And now in this case, clearly we can see two different components in the distribution. So a well-defined peak at the region of low energy around 2 MeV, and then a broad distribution at higher energies that corresponds to the direct decay of the four neutrons in the final state. So first, let me say a few words about this part of the direct decay. So in this case, the um, helium H round state wave function is treated the same five body cluster model Cosma that we saw at the beginning, which includes a surstern that depends on the internal structure of helium H. And the shape of the relative energy spectrum is sensitive to the hyper radius of the source, which is an internal radius of the four neutron system described in the hyperspherical harmonic representation. Now, a hyper radius of 5.6 Fermi is considered as the most realistic one since it reproduces correctly the experimental radius of helium H. So we can see from here that a um, wide distribution is expected that it's centered around 30 MeV, consistent with what we see in the data. Then we did a careful estimation of the background contribution by considering all the possible um, competing processes. So first for the case of uh, direct single step reactions, such as for example, um, single neutron knockout or helium-6 knockout from helium-8, we basically can exclude those cases since the resulted momentum of the proton in those cases is either too small or too high to be accepted by our setup. So basically the only contribution can come from two steps reaction at which in the first interaction, either helium-4 or helium-6 are produced. And then this is followed by proton alpha scattering at backward angles. And overall, we identified four possible processes, which are listed here, and simulated each one of them individually, as shown here by the solid curve. Now, if we compare this to the pure helium-6 case that we saw before, then the distributions are shifted to lower energies and are broadened and this is due to the difference in the binding energies as well as the recall motion. And finally, to estimate the contribution of each reaction, we use measured cross section. And overall, it amounts to 2.6% of the total number of the measured events, which is shown here in green. And an indication that indeed the background contribution is Small can be seen by looking at the distribution of the reaction vertex, where a major difference is expected between a one-step process that is shown here by the red curve versus a two-step process that is shown here by the blue curve. So in the case of a two-step reaction, basically, first of all, helium-4 or helium-6 need to be produced first. And this therefore leads to an exponential increase along the target. And clearly we do not see in our data such an increase which supports our background estimation. So we fit the energy spectrum with the continuum part from the direct decay, as well as the experimental background that we estimated. And then we take into account the low energy peak, which experimentally has a classical resonance-like structure. 
And if we assume a right Wigner uh, function, then it is shown to be consistent with a tetraneutron close to the threshold, which has both energy and width of around 2 MeV. And in addition, it has very high significance. Now, from the theory side, first of all, in general, there is an overall consensus that a bound tetraneutron cannot exist. And this point was addressed again after the Ganil result from 2002. And the conclusion was along the same line as other studies, saying that a tetraneutron, uh, a bound tetraneutron cannot exist without severe modifications of the nuclear forces, which are not compatible with our current understanding. But what about the possibility of uh, resonance? So this case was studied here by trapping the four neutrons in an external wood Saxon potential and then extrapolating the resulting binding energy to the physics limit of the continuum. So basically in the absence of the trap. And this can be seen from here, this plot. We see here their energy versus the potential strength for different uh, trap radii. And the last energy values are extrapolated to zero potential strength, so removing the trap. And this suggested that there might be a possible tetraneutron resonance near 2 MeV, although the conclusion was cautious saying that if such a resonance exists, it must be very broadened. And this work, as well as the Riken results from 2016, motivated many theoretical investigations, which led to several positive predictions, but at the same time, other calculations using different approaches state that also a tetraneutron resonance state cannot exist as we already heard in this morning, unless, for example, unrealistic free body force is used or even four body force is invoked. So as an example, <clears throat> after the recent results from 2016, again, as was discussed this morning, a study tried to reproduce this by <clears throat> A study tried to reproduce the result by considering a two nucleon interaction as well as C1 half free body force that were unchanged, where the only part which was adjusted was the attractive part of the T3 half channel. By doing so, the binding energies of light nuclei, which are not sensitive to this part of the free body force, were reproduced. And here we can see the <coughs> resonance trajectory in the energy plane. And it was found that in order to reproduce the experimental result, which is shown here, a huge strength parameter is required in the range between minus 36 to about minus 30 MeV, which is non-physical. For comparison, it is about 15 times larger than the strength for the T1 half part, although, as we also heard this morning, it must be smaller. And in addition, it was shown to be inconsistent with the description of neighboring nuclei. Then a different possibility that was raised is that a resonance-like structure can be observed but due to other quantum mechanical effects, which have no relation to tetraneutron states. So here in this case, the uh, four neutron system was studied in the momentum space using the transition operator method. And although no resonance of four neutrons was found in this calculation, it was found that some transition operators like the one which is shown here, for example, in a two plus two configuration that corresponds to two pairs of neutrons. So such transition operators exhibit a low energy enhancement, as you can see here. 
And then it was suggested that such an enhancement can also occur in other reactions with four neutron subsystem as the final stage, such as the double charge exchange reaction that was used in the Riken measurement. But in order to see how this would affect on the measured relative energy spectrum, this has to be combined with a reaction model that describes the specific kinematical configuration which is used. And finally, I would like to show a comparison between experimental data and theory predictions in terms of energy versus the width of such a resonance. So the result that we obtain is shown here by the red full circle, where the previous Riken result is shown by the open one. And although very different reactions were used in order to try to populate a tetraneutron state, they are still consistent with each other within the uncertainty. Then the theory predictions are shown by the blue symbols. So for example, the blue band represents the result from a quantum Monte Carlo calculation with an extrapolation to the continuum. And therefore only the energy was calculated without an information on the width. And then the full stars uh, show a calculation based on no core shell model extended to the continuum using the harmonic oscillator representation where the different stars represent different uh, model spaces. And calculations have also been performed within the no core gamma shell model where the arrow here indicates that this is a lower limit on the width. But, uh, uh, but again, um, other theories exclude the possibility of the existence of such a resonance. And basically the drastically different predictions demonstrate the importance of our new experimental data, which will hopefully motivate further calculations that are clearly essential to understand the low energy peak that we observe. And in particular, as already discussed here in this workshop many times, it's a region, whether this is a for neutron resonance or that this is a result of other uh, correlation between the neutrons. And with that, I uh, just want to thank all the collaborators who are part of this work and contributed to it. And thank you for your attention.